uh, that will might be included in the recording. Um, my name is Denise Robbins. I'm the Communications Director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network, and I'm joined by Anthony Field, who is our Maryland Grassroots Coordinator at CCAN, who several of you probably have met. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started. Can everyone see that okay? All right. Uh, so thank you for joining again. Uh, this is our Writing for Advocacy training. You'll learn how to write and you'll learn how to specifically have some good tips for great letters to the editor, blog posts, public comments, and more. So just an overview of how this evening will go. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a quick background about CCAN and our work. Uh, then we'll get into what, why we're doing this on Zoom, you know, our, how we can be advocates uh, while social distancing. Then I'll get into the broad writing tips uh, and then get into the specifics. And of course, there'll be time at the end for questions and answers and you will be out of your computers by eight o'clock. All right, so CCAN was formed in 2002. Uh, it was when most people weren't really yet concerned about climate change. Uh, there were no grassroots organizations exclusively devoted to the issue in our region. So that's why CCAN formed and that's what CCAN does. Since then, we use our grassroots power to bring amazing climate victories to our region. Most recently in Maryland, uh, we passed the Clean Energy Jobs Act for 50% renewable electricity and a pathway to 100%. Um, and we're fighting frac gas pipelines. We've been fighting the Potomac pipeline for a few years and still hasn't been built and hopefully it never will. Um, we're still fighting the Eastern Shore pipeline. Uh, there's still more battles ahead and more on that later. But we're not done. Uh, we need to keep fighting for the massive economy-wide changes that scientists are telling us we really need for climate stability. So that brings us to today. Um, you might be here because you're wondering how the heck we are supposed to do this. How can we keep fighting for climate solutions with so many of us social distancing at home because of coronavirus? Um, so I just want to acknowledge, first of all, that these are Still unprecedented and scary times. Coronavirus is still here and we take it very seriously. Um, yet the need to organize has never felt more important. It feels a lot like democracy is at stake more than ever. Um, we are going to keep fighting climate change. We will keep promoting fighting climate change. Even as we promote social distancing, uh, re reopen orders and no, you know, we are not, this is not to say don't join in in-person protests when they happen. Uh, a lot of them recently have been super important, uh, but that's not what today in particular is going to be about. It's going to be about organizing digitally. Uh, and in fact, advocacy has already been trending this way towards the digital. So in a sense, uh, our plans aren't changing and writing has always had a big role to play and it will continue to have a really big role to play in reshaping the narrative. The, the narrative while we're all at home. So now we're going to get into some writing best practices. And as I mentioned, um, I'm going to ask you to use the chat box. So I just want to pose a question to you all. What makes a piece of writing powerful to you? What if have you read an article or an opinion piece or even a Facebook post about climate change or any other advocacy issue? What has really helped that resonate? Writer's voice, definitely. It's nice to have a good tone of voice. Focus, brevity, yes. Getting to the point, those are both great. If you link your personal story to an issue passionately, so getting personal and getting passionate, getting the facts out there, that's great. Um, making it fun, also amazing. Um, connecting with values, clear, when it makes a strong statement. Absolutely. Um, these are all really, really great answers, and we're going to touch upon a lot of them tonight. So I just want to let you all know uh, about a piece of writing that has, was really powerful for me. This is an open letter from Bill McKibben that he wrote in 2011 
when I was a senior in college, um, I think the summer before I was a senior of college even, and I was a climate activist. I was, you know, involved in the anti-tracking movement. I really cared, but I had never been arrested in my life, and I never wanted, planned to get arrested. And then there was this letter from Bill McKibben, who I adored, um, asking everyone in the country or even beyond uh, to come to Washington, D.C. and protest the Keystone XL pipeline and get arrested. And it totally took me out of my comfort zone, but I read this letter, and I was just so moved that not only did I want to go do that immediately, but I called my mom and I was like, you have to fly down from Wisconsin and like get arrested in DC. Um, so this is uh, just an example of a piece of writing that was so powerful to me that it inspired me to act. And that is really what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I'm going to send around uh, an email following up and it'll link to uh, that, that letter from Bill McKibben. It's actually not really available online anymore. So now I'm going to get into our five tips for really good advocacy writing. And uh, we'll start with number one. Uh, what the first person said, brevity, short words win. Um, so a lot of slogans, a lot of really good phrases employ short words for, for the reason, which is that short words stick in our minds more easily and they resonate with more force. So you can really remember them. Um, does anybody, can anybody think of any slogans that come to mind that employ short words? And if you could use that chat box again. Black Lives Matter, yes. No taxation without representation. Those words are not super short, but they are very simple and succinct. Just do it, yeah. Flatten the curve, not me, us. Oh, these are all great. Um, it gets better. These are great. Um, I will say I've been asking this question. Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I've been asking this question for like almost four years now. And when I first started uh, doing so four years ago, everyone would say, yes, we can. And I've been getting a little bit nervous because um, no one has said that for the past year or so. So I'm like, <laughs> all right, the Obama years haven't been totally forgotten yet. So anyways, um, thank, thank you all. Yes, those are all great. Uh, yes, we can. And the other two that often are most said are just do it and make America great again, which um, honestly, I'm kind of glad that the just do it and make MAGA didn't really get mentioned. Um, so we have people who aren't like following Nike or anyway. anyways. Um, yeah, but these are all, all of those phases that you all mentioned were also awesome and they work uh, for the reason that you can remember them when just called upon in a random Zoom meeting. Um, all right, never use a long word where a short one will do. That is, that is always just best practice. You know, don't use jargon, don't use technical words when something simple will do. Uh, tip number two, repetition works, repeat to compete. So this is an excerpt from probably one of the most famous pieces of writing ever, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And he had very strong points that he needed to make, and he employed the, the use of repetition a lot. Um, dedicated to the proposition, a nation that is dedicated, we're dedicated to this task, and it's the government of the people, by the people, for the people. So people that are dedicated, and that was what he used to unite the nation. Um, a lot of studies show that repeated exposure to a statement increases its acceptance as being true, uh, which can work against us and it can work for us. A lot of climate change deniers will just repeat their same arguments over and over and over again. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it's important to understand how that works so that you can use it in your favor. Uh, repeating your key phrase over and over again. If several people are saying the same thing, it sounds more like a chorus. Uh, <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, if you're writing a letter to the editor or a blog post and you have a phrase that you really want people to come away with, you, you can repeat it. You can say it more than one time. You can say it in a few different ways. Number three, feelings 
eat fat. Um, this this used to say feelings trump fat, but the word trump has some feelings associated with it. So I have officially changed it to feelings beat facts. Um, it is a hard truth of psychology that facts alone are not sufficient to persuade people. If somebody disagrees with a fact, or, or if a fact disagrees with somebody's worldview, they're much more likely to reject the fact, not their framework for viewing the world. Uh, in fact, we're actually hardwired, hardwired to understand the world through emotions and through stories, so feelings. Um, just as a subset of this, you know, number, when it comes to numbers, oftentimes the bigger the numbers, the less people care. Um, on the left is a picture of sea monkeys. I don't know how many of you might have had a sea monkey farm in your classroom growing up, perhaps, but when, as a school pet, they didn't really you know, make that great of a pet. If one or two of them died, like, kids wouldn't really care. But as opposed to, like, a school gerbil or guinea pig, like, one animal that an the kids could really care about. Um, similarly, you know, there's just a lot of stories, like, personal stories of one person that can really resonate. On the right is a picture of Callan Benson, um, who's an amazing Maryland uh, student climate activist, good friend of CCAN, who herself was very inspired by another girl's story, Greta Thunberg, and her, her strikes um, outside the Swedish embassy. And she spent every day, uh, I believe not this past session, but the previous session, silent, on a silent strike, uh, crocheting a giant scarf outside the Maryland General Assembly um, to support climate action. And it was very inspirational. She got a lot of people interested, asking her what was going on, um, and her story really, really resonated with people. The story of one person can be way more powerful than all the facts in the world. So, you really want to try to show rather than tell. Um, people are moved by stories that they can relate to. Uh, here's the here's the difference of showing, telling, talking about a fact versus showing it. Studies show that sea levels are already rising around Maryland. Scientists have forecasted an increase of as much as 2.1 feet in the Chesapeake Bay by 2050. That's a fact. Here's the story. Ellicott City, Maryland just experienced 2,000 year floods in two years. The historic town was decimated, cars were swept away, and the floods caused the death of National Guardsman Sergeant Edison Herman. Think about which one is more likely to motivate you. Now, this, this, this rule about numbers, it's not an unbreakable rule, so I shouldn't even say it's a rule. Um, but because numbers can be actually very effective and powerful when they're used effectively. And they're helpful when they're superlative. So if you have a number that is, you know, if you're saying that something is the first ever time that this thing happened, or it's like the biggest number of people at this protest ever, or an unprecedented, uh, record-breaking, you know, climate record, that, that can be very effective. It's also helpful if they are shocking. Um, sometimes numbers can be shocking enough to really stir people. And one that sticks out for me is two years ago when the IPCC came out with that number that we have 12 years to save the world, essentially, to cut uh, global emissions in half to prevent catastrophe. Of course, that was two years ago, so now it's only 10 years. But when, the, when it was 12 years, I was, I was in Scotland when that report came out, and it was on the front pages of all the newspapers and the airports. I was like, what's going on? I'm supposed to be on vacation. Why is work following me here? Um, no, but it was, it was, it was crazy. It, like, everyone was talking about it for, for a long time after that. And I think it really inspired a lot of people to act. Finally, a number can be helpful when it is supportive. If, you, if it, you're using it to bolster your overall argument. For example, with the Ellicott City example, um, if you're telling the story of Ellicott City, you know, what is a specific statistic number that can really help drive that home? You know, how many more catastrophic floods is it expected to face? How much more often? Um, okay. Now on to number four, key elements of a good story. So 
this this goes along very closely with the show don't tell um, you know feelings over facts but when you're thinking about a good story there are four key elements that you want to employ or at least think about I will say as a caveat for all of these any good given piece of writing doesn't have to hit every single one of these tips and all of these different things like I'm giving you a lot of information um, and if we want to keep writing short and brief it's not going to be able to take in everything so all of this is just a tool for you to like use and pull out um, when it is most effective so uh, key elements of good story you want a relatable protagonist uh, think about somebody who's facing a relatable universal conflict. That could be you. Maybe you're telling your own story. Could be your your mom or your neighbor. Um, you want lots of conflict. You know, conflict is the oxygen of storytelling, absolutely, uh, just as it is of advocacy. So, this protagonist, what are what are you facing? What is the person in your story facing? A lows and villain always help. Um, someone to to fight against. It's always a good way to unite around a common cause. Um, often it's just more compelling if it's an individual person rather than a group or, an, or a corporation. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers when the BP Gulf oil still happened. I do. Uh, but BP, you know, was very much of a villain. But also the CEO, Tony, then went on camera saying, I want my life back. And that was just like, okay, um, <laughs> very off-putting to say the least. Um, the, the, the last thing about the good story is the kitchen sink details. So you want to put your reader in the shoes of the protagonist you know what is the view from the land of the gas company uh, the land that the gas company wants to put its pipeline what are the sounds and the smells of that coal plant across the street uh, what are all the ways that you can use several of the five senses you know be as concrete as possible uh, the last tip of these five um, metaphors metaphors work magic so when you're writing about an abstract issue, especially, you want to take time to consider how you can bring it home through metaphor. It's very much proven that metaphors really help make abstract concepts familiar, make them more tangible, and make it more likely that an idea or concept will stick. Um, and in fact, our brain can actually light up in different ways. It sort of changes the way that you think. If you think about a concept, rather than as a set of numbers, but through a story, through this metaphor, your brain will let it in different ways and it can change how you think about it. Here's an example of the metaphor in communicating the scale of climate science. Which statement sparks more concern? How will we talk? Human-caused emissions of carbon dioxide have a powerful effect in warming the Earth. The carbon dioxide that we've already pumped into the atmosphere has the same warming impact as 1 million Hiroshima bombs exploded every day. Does that help put the context into the scale into some sort of context? Pretty crazy. Um, someone just wrote in the chat, remember the boiling frog. That is also a very good metaphor. Okay, so now we're going to... Um, oh. Here's an example of a metaphor. Um, when Governor Hogan won his second term as, as governor of Maryland, it was the year of the massive, what everyone was calling the blue wave around, around the country, uh, just a lot of Democratic wins um, in the lower ballot. And he's wearing this purple tie because he said, as a Republican, that he was using his purple surfboard to ride the blue wave. Um, this is an excerpt from an article of his win. He brought his purple surfboard to the blue wave. And not just historic victory. So we decided to, to take that metaphor. We, we were kind of annoyed uh, that Governor Hogan was trying to co-opt this metaphor because we were not a fan of him at that point. Um, they have, you know, a long and varied conflicting history, but he had just vetoed the previous Clean Energy Jobs Act, our uh, previous 
renewable energy policy. And he signed the fracking ban, but only after we had a veto-proof majority. You know, he likes to take a lot of credit while actually being pretty bad on environmental issues. So we were really annoyed, and we're just trying to think about how we could, like, take this metaphor back. And we decided on the first day of session, um, when we were promoting the most recently passed Clean Energy Jobs Act, to, to hand that up and uh, call on him to now ride the climate wave and take that purple surfboard and pass the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Because at the same time, um, we had just unprecedented support for this policy. We had a super majority worth of legislators who had signed on in support. So this, you know, there's a huge wave of support for good climate policy. And so we called on him to, to join, you know, we were extending a hand. And that's kind of the power of a, meta, a good metaphor is that it can be extended. You know, you can, it's not just like one image and then it's done, but like how can you move around in that image and, and bring, bring it even further? Okay, so now I'm going to just recap those five tips and then we'll go through a few more takeaways and then get into the specifics. Um, that people find should not be there. Start words win is tip number one. Repeat to compete. Feeling beat fat. So don't tell. Tell your story. Tell a good story. Have the good storytelling elements and use your metaphors. And I, I have a few other just thoughts that I wanted to put in this general writing section that didn't really fit into those uh, broad tips. There it is. There we go. Uh, when you're advocacy writing, you're not writing an academic essay. You know, you're writing to, to reach people. You, you don't have to prove your point with a million studies. Um, you can just speak from the heart. You want to think of your audience and your goal. Um, so this kind of has to do with what outlet you're trying to write in or for. Um, yeah, who are you writing for? Being concise, I just think this is worth emphasizing as much as possible, not just in terms of short words, but short sentences, you know, short, short paragraphs, like getting to that point and not saying more than you necessarily need to say. Use metaphor when possible. It's just another thing to emphasize. And writing from the heart. Honestly, a lot of what I what makes me the happiest is when I'm able to help others just really write from the heart and like tell their own story. And that's that's really what we're we're going for. All right. Now we're gonna get into the specifics. Letters to the editor. Um a letter to the editor is found in your average newspaper um, that publishes, you know, articles, op-eds, editorials. They'll have a section where they allow their readers to provide feedback in response to the things that they publish. So anybody, and this is, will be another request for the use of chat. Uh, anybody have any ideas for why writing letters to the editor can be helpful for advocacy? I hope they think they're helpful. Yeah, that awareness, absolutely. Politicians read the paper. Oh my gosh, that is like perfect. Allows anyone to share their voice. Yeah, reach a wide audience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of people only read local papers, and they should they should get everyone's opinion out there. Awesome, all really great answers. Thanks. Um, yeah, there are a lot of benefits. Um, it can show that an issue is newsworthy. Uh, newspapers tend to print letters that they consider newsworthy and important in the community. Um, they can show for our legislators and other decision makers that there is community interest in, in a topic, <clears throat> especially if there are several letters published on a certain issue. It's a good way for people to get the pulse of the community, especially for these local local papers. And, you know, especially if a decision maker, like if a letter mentions a decision maker by name. And it can provide visibility, yep, awareness to our issues, even when they're not in the news. It can help us make news. 
So how do you write an LTE? Um, there's not like a silver bullet, but there is a general formula that you want to follow, and it's pretty simple. Number one, you want to start with a hook. You want to be responding to a story and mention that story and pivot as quickly as possible to your perspective. This is a great article, but this article got this wrong, and here's what I have to say next. You want to ID the problem right away. Um, so this can be what the story is missing, maybe what it gets wrong, or maybe it doesn't get anything wrong, but you would just like to bring your new perspective to an issue. Uh, then you want to provide some evidence. And again, LPEs are pretty short, so you want them to, to just have one or two facts and your personal story or your personal story to back it up. Finally, because this is an advocacy writing, you want to have a solution and a call to action. Um, what should the public do next? What should our campaign target do next to address this? Um, a few other ways to help get published. Uh, you want to increase your credibility if possible. And this means, you know, what makes you in particular qualified to write about a subject it doesn't mean you have to get a degree in a certain subject. It could just be if you live in a community that's going to be affected by something. Um, or if you have an affliction, perhaps asthma, and you're writing about air pollution. You know, what is your personal connection or professional connection that can help increase your credibility and make you the, the authority? Personalizing it. This is, this is huge. Um, you want to both choose facts that are relevant to your area and be really get your story in there if possible. Uh, and finally, keeping it short, um, definitely. Papers have word counts usually for letters to the editor of 250-ish words, depending on the paper. Um, sometimes it's just better to even go under that and just make it really short, as short as possible and have that be more likely to be published. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna just go over a quick sample letter to the editor. I will put this up on the screen and let you read it for a minute or so, and then ask people to put in the chat what they think is working in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was actually, um, I just see someone wrote second paragraph to worry. I was going to have the addendum be, if people have positive critiques, that is also definitely acceptable. How could this be even better? Be careful questions. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Empathy for the people that are trying to persuade. Good call to action. Yeah. So lots to like and also lots to improve, perhaps. Um, Straightforward. You have some improvements as well. All right, um, thanks for the comments, everyone. I guess I feel like this was actually probably more difficult LTE than I <laughs> remembered it being. Um, so I actually will probably, in the follow-up, send around uh, uh, a sample LTE that is hopefully a little less wordy, but I think there's also a lot to like in this. Um, I also just want to highlight something that someone wrote in the chat uh, right before this, which is that, and the question of what, why LTEs can help. It can help show editors what people care about and give them incentives to write more articles about those issues. I think that was a really great answer. I just wanted to point it out. Um, okay, so LTEs, you know, we always, it, if, if you're going to write an LTE for one of our campaigns, we very frequently have letter to the editor guides, which gives you a list of outlets and some like talking points and sample LTEs even. Um, but again, the samples in this one, I was also going to say, I, I wish that it had uh, more of more of a personal story in here. I feel like that's just always a really good thing to read in an LTE. Um, so our sample LTEs that we provide you. Uh, don't have your personal story. So there's, there's only, you know, there's always more that someone can add. Okay. Um, right. You also, before you publish or before you send something in, you want to make sure that you review a publication's requirements and word counts because it does vary, usually around 200 to 250. All right. Before we move on to blog posts and public comments, I just wanted to add that this is kind of a new thing that we're promoting, which is to write a comment, an online comment on an article. If you see an article that's worth responding to, or we send around an article perhaps asking for an LTE, and you don't have time to, to write a whole LTE, but just want to get your opinion out there, I really want to urge people to, to write more comments online. And that's, first of all, a good way to, like, Flex those writing chops, you know, get that quick personal story hit or quick shocking fact that you want to get in there right away. Um, and it's also a good way, just like letters, for a newspaper to gauge reaction to what they're putting out there and for people who are reading the articles, perhaps, to, to see the reaction. Um, and finally, you know, half of all the newspaper subscribers are reading articles online anyways. So the people that you're trying to reach via, via print paper, they're mostly reading online articles as well. So you'll be reaching the same people. So that's just a quick thing on that. All right, the next thing, practical application, blog posts. Um, CCAN, CCAN is always looking for good blog topics to post on our website. Uh, so people are always looking for things to read. We're always looking for good topics. But you might also have your own blog or think about starting one. And this is a good time for that too. Um, contributing to a blog is also a good 
backup plan for if you write in a letter to the editor and perhaps it doesn't get published. So much of what I just said still applies, but the format for blog posts is a bit different. Um, and here's how our format for contributing to CCAN's blog, what we recommend. Oops, you want a good headline uh, and often recommending even a couple of headlines to choose between. Um, you want to have an introduction to like set the stage that's pretty newsy, but not necessarily responding to an article or an op-ed like, or things like that. But something that's short and pithy and gets to what you're trying to say really quickly. And then you actually want to say it. You know, what, are, what is, is an argument or a story that you're trying to tell? And in terms of the body, you know, actually filling out the blog post, um, we really recommend, you know, frequent, frequent paragraph breaks, like short paragraphs. When it comes to reading things online, big blocks of text, like you just learned, can, can seem intimidating and overwhelming, and people will be more likely to skip an article that doesn't have white space. So to help make that white space, uh, you know, add a lot of subheadings, bulleted lists, and short paragraphs to make the article easy to digest. You want to have your outro, and that's where you bring it back home, uh, talk about next steps, you know, what's the next action. We always have some action that we're working for and inviting people to engage. In blog posts as opposed to LTEs, we love having images. We usually have one very horizontal one at the top and several additional ones throughout. Um, and length can really vary, you know. It's longer than a letter to the editor. We usually have like a minimum of 500, uh, but it can get up to 2,000 words. And in fact, posts over 1,000 words in length, uh, some studies recently show, get shared more. People want to share articles that they think are worth reading. So I think people want to kind of have something to sink their teeth into. So if you want to write a blog post, I wouldn't fear getting a little bit longer to really dive into a topic. In terms of style, um, we, a lot of, you know, this is up to you, but of what we prefer on the CCAN blog, you know, again, we want to avoid the jargon and the technical terms, adaptation, mitigation, um, and go for the conversational and relatable tones instead. Honesty, uh, you know, just really be true, speak your truth. Um, we enjoy snarkiness and even playfulness. Um, and, Ultimately, you want a post to be useful or emotional or both. And what, what does that mean? So here are some recommended topics. Um, we can post on our blog your personal story about something, and how-to or, or an advice article. Uh, frequently asked questions about a certain, certain topic that you may be interested in recently. Explainers, listicles or maybe just an opinion piece if something's really been, been nagging at you. Um, so if you can't think of any ideas, but you want to write, you know, we also re recommend just reading other blogs or reading the news or just see what people are writing on, uh, writing online. Um, it can be helpful just to read article titles to get an idea for your own angle for something. Find out what's going on in the world, see what's trending, maybe even from Twitter or Facebook, and then form your own opinion. This is the last uh, piece of technical advice we'll provide, and then we'll allow a lot of time for questions. Um, public comments are super, super important for a lot of our advocacy campaigns. Uh, does anybody have any ideas of when we use public comments for climate advocacy? If you could put them in the chat. We have one coming up right now on the Eastern Shore. Legislative hearings when the administration wants to roll back environmental rules. Absolutely. NEPA, yes. When a law or regulation is being drafted, yes. Um, a lot of the, the regulations. Yeah, so uh, public comments. You know, federal agencies and state agencies and more local 
federal agencies uh, will put out requests for federal comments when they're formulating regulations and um, also when there's new proposals for projects like frack gas pipelines they have to they have to re receive certain permits several permits and there's often public comments associated with each one of those uh, so those are always a good way for an important way for people to engage right now we have the eastern shore pipeline proposed um, and there's there's a public comment period we'll probably put that put that comment link in the chat or in the follow-up from the bill um, mm -hmm. so yeah the uh, few things I will say about public comments um, oh, sorry about that. Uh, number one, you, you want to remember your audience and remember that facts are probably even more important in this public comment process than in an LTE, for instance. Um, you're talking about pretty dry government agencies and bodies, and they may not be swayed by the feelings, but the key, the shocking facts. Uh, to make your really strong case uh, will be really important here. That being said, your personal story still absolutely matters. Um, what, and that means making those comments specific to your experience. How a proposed pipeline could impact your way of life, or if you have a personal uh, connection to anything that's going to be affected, which when it comes to climate change, we kind of all are. You want to tailor your comments to the specifics of the permits at issue. So for instance, on the Eastern Shore Pipeline, their waterway permit is, is up right now for, for public comment. Um, so what are the water issues that are the most important? Like what are the water facts that we can really bring up and what are what are the ways that threats to drinking water you know matter to you air pollution permits are another one so um things like that technical expertise and this you know is more more of an open question it's because we know not everyone would necessarily have it and she can always want to try to provide that when we give out a sample comment uh, but if you have technical expertise to add, like scientific expertise or policy expertise, that is always helpful. Uh, and finally, keep in mind that public comments are not just for writing and submitting, but they can be spoken aloud uh, during hearings and during bill hearings as well. Um, so when you're when you're saying comments aloud, you know it's still writing. It's still advocacy writing. You're just writing it beforehand and then reading it. Um, and, you know, in fact, when it comes to any writing, I actually very much recommend reading something out loud. It's just for your own sake. Here, you can spot any grammatical issues or see just how well it flows or if it sounds natural. Um, so, any, any, you know, time during the process of writing, Read it out loud, test it out that way. Um, okay, so great. Now we are going to get into some questions. And I see a bunch of questions already in the chat. Uh, however, if you would like to additionally add your question uh, audio-wise, you can do that. And to do that, you can raise your hand uh, by clicking the participants button and then the raise hand button. Or if you're on your phone, you can dial star nine, and then Anthony will unmute you. Um, but I will go back and read some of these questions. Um, the first one was about public about comments on articles. Often with climate articles, there are a lot of nasty and ignorant comments. This makes me not want to comment. What is your feeling about that? Um, I, I definitely know that there's a lot of nasty people commenting on climate articles out there. Um, but I think it's just a matter of like 
ignoring them. I, I'm not telling anybody to read the comments. I know that I know that some decision makers read them, and so that's that's where this request comes from, and the newspapers read them. But you know, if there's like five just silly, stupid comments on an article, and then there's like five really nice and thought out and concise like pro climate science comments, I have to imagine that that has a positive impact for someone who is reading that article. And they go down and, you know, see, oh, people actually really care. Um, so if people aren't comfortable posting comments, that is totally fine. You know, it's just like kind of a new recommendation. Um, definitely don't read them if you don't want to get lost in that whirlwind, but if you want to recommend people try commenting. Um, Scrolling down, I have a blog. I have some of these things, but not others. I have my own style. How can I tell whether I need to change my blog? Do I adopt your suggestions or keep doing what I've been doing? Um, yeah, I think having your own style is 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 important, and I'm not. I would not recommend anyone change that um, for our suggestions. In fact, every single one of these tips, suggestions are really just suggestions. Again, from the beginning, it's just about allowing people to find their own voice and tell their own story in the most effective way. And so if what you're doing has, if you have a style that you like, keep that up for sure. You know, maybe just think about like, what are some of the like, if your style, I, I doubt your style is like science, technical only jargon, you know what I mean? Like um, style, style, is, style is good. And if there's some tips on reducing jargon or something like that, not knowing much of uh, what your blog is like, then that might helpful, be helpful. But definitely keep it up. Do you have an editor for CCAM blog posts? Um, yes. I, I, in fact, do edit blog posts for our web page. And um, we would love to have your comments on the Eastern Shore Pipeline turn into a CCAM blog post. I think that would be great. Um, just real quick, Anthony, are there any hands raised? Otherwise, I'll just keep reading from the chat. No, there's no hands at the moment. OK. Um, it is easier to attend hearings now that they're all online. That is so true. <laughs> that, is, that is an upside of all these hearings being online. And also ask questions when you're at a hearing. Um, absolutely. So they can be wind up being answered on the record. Yeah, that is um, getting into some testimony specifics that I am super not the expert in, but that is a really great suggestion. And when it comes to coming up with testimony at hearings, um, asking questions, that sounds great. Be brief but brilliant. That is really good advice. <laughs> if only everyone could do that. Is it effective to sign up to group campaigns from organizations' appeals? Yes. I, I would say yes. Um, a lot of like organizational sign-on letters are, are important for showing whichever decision maker they're geared towards, just the range and breadth of, of support that an issue may have. Wear costumes to public hearings when appropriate. <laughs> I don't think this is getting a little away from writing, but definitely you can wear a costume also when you're writing, probably. Um, I'm writing to individual floaters in Florida through a Sierra Club initiative. Should I write for my own, their POV or my own? Oh, that is a great question. Um, it might sound like a cop-out, but I want to say both. Because if you're writing to someone, you know, in Florida, A, you don't really know a whole lot about them, but you could do what you can to meet them where they are, right? So maybe that means um, if, you, if, you, if you can get as local as possible, uh, what are some of the climate impacts that you might be able to, to bring up and, and point out and say, and say, like, I, I imagine your concerns, you know, or, yeah, just, just kind of try to put yourself in their, in their frame of mind. 
and what they're experiencing. And I would say, what is your own story can be effective too, even for somebody who lives in a different state. Why climate change is an issue that matters to everyone. You know, it's not a local issue. It has local impacts, but um, not a local issue. So meet someone where they are and then pivot into your own story. I have less motivation to write than I used to because I think people are so overwhelmed with newsletters, etc. I wonder if anyone is reading my writing. Any advice about just ticketing stuff so it gets to more re readers? Um, that's a tough question. I, I think that people are reading a lot more than they used to. Um, that's probably just my opinion. I haven't done any like research on it, but I don't know. We're all kind of stuck inside most of the time. We are getting probably more emails than normal, but if nothing else, it's nice to kind of break through that with a newsletter that can be particularly inspirational or joyful. Um, it's, it's tough, you know, getting, uh, if you're talking about email newsletters, you know, subject lines really, really matter and, and trying to grab people um, so they can look through that giant inbox and, and see what they want to read. Uh, any other questions? 